Hello, everyone. Welcome to this presentation. Um, so we often hear people saying that Spring Boot does all kinds of magic and you don't know what's going on. And Animated banner, for instance. <laughs> that one. Th this one is magic, really. This one. Uh, um, so we wanted to, to have a, a talk so you could go from how does that magic work to, ah, oh, this is working like this. And by the end of that talk, you should be able to reuse that infrastructure and be like, yeah, this is not magic at all. It's just stuff that I use every day now. So we hope that we'll explain everything and uh, that uh, we'll, uh, there won't be any magic by the end of that talk. So remember, this is a deep dive session, um, three slots. Um, so the, the way we intended to do this is 45 minutes, then 20 minutes break so that you can rest your brain a bit, probably be necessary, and then 45 minutes again. Um, so we'll cover all kinds of topics. Uh, we'll do gently at the beginning, like really the basics, then going to the harder stuff, hopefully not too hard to explain, and then we'll gently um, land again with a few additional concepts and misconceptions about Spring Boot or Spring in general. Yeah. Cool. So let's get started, or what? Yeah. Oh, do we have a couple of questions, maybe? Oh, yeah. So first one, who is using Spring Boot? Keep your hand up if you're using it in production. What? All right, Brilliant. so go down. Who's not using Spring Boot? That would probably be easier. One, two, three, four, five, six. Cool. OK, maybe 20. Interesting. Perfect. Okay, good. Perfect. Um, so um, we'll use, a, um, in, in the course of this talk, we'll use a very basic Spring Boot application, as you'll see with a, a, a service that's very complex. Not complex at all, you'll see. So the purpose is not to focus on the, on the functionality, but on the infrastructure, because that's really what Spring Boot is all about, right? Um, configuring things by default for you, providing opinions and how you can, uh, how you can actually um, customize those opinions or maybe provide your own uh, implementation. So um, let's have a look to our um, domain today. Very complex. Um, so we have this interface that says hello is a name. Told you, very complex. <laughs> and there is an implementation that um, takes a prefix and a suffix uh, so here, hello and uh, exclamation mark, and basically output something in the console. Well, that implementation outputs something in the console, so hello world, basically. And we have an app. Um, this app has a dependency for now on that service. And the most simple Spring Boot starter you could find. And this app is empty for them at the moment. OK, does nothing. So should we implement something now, or should we? Yeah, let's go. OK. Yeah. So let's implement something that we will use. Uh, so hello command line run. Oh, oops. Hello command line runner. So what I want to do is I want to, use this, I want to use this hello service to do something. So for that, I can use the command line runner from Spring Boot. It's a callback interface um, where I can run something once the application has, has started. And I want to use the hello service. And let's start this app. Oh, yeah, I need to make that a component. And let's start this app. As you, will, as you may expect, uh, that app will fail. Yeah, we don't have any implementation, or we, we can't inject anything. So we don't like know that. about hello service. Mm -hmm. no, doesn't work. So you can see here we get an, a very nice error message. You'll find out how to uh, create your own later in this talk. And OK, just to get started, let's, let's create a bean. So let's create a version of the yellow service. And say something like uh, OD. And I have a bad character here. There we go. So I'm creating a bean definition for the, the, the thing that does not exist. And nothing happens. Why? Because I guess I didn't call it, right? Probably call it would be better. <laughs> Sorry about that. So instead of printing hello or whatnot, you could, you could think about this about uh, like uh, how do you configure a Tomcat embedded Tomcat server or uh, anything related to a database, etc. So we're going to use 
that sample, but that's, this can, can be applied to any other thing we are auto-configuring in Spring Boot. So yeah, here's what, here's what we've got. Uh, so our sim simple uh, application is uh, annotated with Spring Boot application. It's got a main method, and uh, we're running the application uh, running that main method. So if we move uh, here, we know that that Spring Boot application, it's actually meta-annotated. It's uh, several, several annotations in one. So if you look at the source of that annotation, you can see that it's made of several. Uh, the first one is Spring Boot configuration, which is more or less like at configuration with a little twist. Um, we've got component scan, which is about scanning for uh, beans and components in your application. So if you don't provide anything by default, it will scan from the current package of that class and under. And we've got the last one, which, uh, which does all the magic, and we'll see it's not magic at all. Uh, don't say magic. <laughs> So enable auto configuration, it's triggering all the auto configuration uh, for Spring Boot. So looking at signs and uh, opinions that you've got in your application and configuring things for you. So it can be very simple or you can express opinions in more complex ways or subtle ways with, with properties, with customizer and whatnot. And we're, we'll adapt to that and give you the best experience possible. So what, what that means also is that neither component scanning or the auto configuration infrastructure is a mandatory concept in Spring Boot. So you could completely disable them. You could not use component scan at all if you want to. Or you could also use Spring Boot without the auto configuration if you choose to. You lose a lot of features, but there is nothing that prevents you to do that. Hmm. So th this is, uh, we wanted to show you that just to show you that uh, a Spring Boot application is just reusing several parts of infrastructure. And uh, if you selectively enable them, you get the ex expected result. It's, it's not one hard-coded code path that says, I'm doing everything. It's really uh, component-driven. It's really organized, just like our code base, so you can see what's going on. Okay. So we already talked a bit about component scan. So component scan will scan for beans and components uh, within a particular package. So if you provide one in the annotation or the current package uh, where you declared it. And uh, so that's how it goes. So if you declare it on, in a, on a class in package, come example, hello, it will scan into alpha and bravo. And uh, obviously the come example, charlie, won't be, won't be scanned at all. And, um, it can be, it, it can look like obvious in that case, but it happens a lot. Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, if you if you don't create your application with start.spring.io, um, uh, start.spring.io not only provides a build.gradle or a pom.xml file with all the right dependencies and all, it's, it's providing you with the right structure. And by accident, if you just uh, like create a class in the in the wrong in the wrong place, you can end up with something in come example Charlie, and it won't be scanned at all, and you don't know why. It's it's really it, it can happen really easily if you if you don't pay attention. So to fix that, obviously you need to move that package, and it will be scanned. So that's why we try to have that Spring Boot application annotation, which should be at the root of your application, and you should like design your package structure so that it it's organized like this. So um, this is really the recommendation, right? So you have a dedicated package for your app. Uh, your app is in that package, and then you structure your code underneath. Um, if you do that, you'll get, as Brian just explained, um, sensible behavior by default, but um, it will also expand to, to things that we don't have the time to cover today like slicing, so slice test, where you only focus on a part of your application. For instance, data JPA test allows you to test only your data layer. WebMVC test allows you to, to only test a controller. So we, we are doing something to start the application with a narrow view of your components, basically. And this is also using that as a default. If you disagree with that, so you want to structure your code differently, uh, it will be all, all right. But then you have, you'll have to configure that yourself. Okay, so component is one annotation, but we've got many more. Uh, configuration, repository, controller, etc. Uh, many of those are specialized types of components. Uh, some of them, like service, are just components in disguise. They're, they're 
just doing the same thing. It's just a declarative way to say this is a service. So it's and just for you to dedicate its stereotype. Yeah. yeah. And others are doing more. They have more attributes and they tell more about your component and they are treated differently. Um, Let's go and uh, do that on our application. Yeah, or, I guess. I guess. Yeah. What, something I could I could quickly quickly mention here is uh, we, uh, we can play a bit with our app. Uh, and for instance, we can demonstrate remove Spring Boot application. So it's basically removing all features. And then you notice you notice that um, the message does, is not print out. So basically, if you remove that um, configuration is disabled. So this is not really taken into account. Component scan is disabled, so this class is not scanned anymore. And this application is starting without um, uh, the auto configuration support. Right now, in this case, we're not using any of it, so that's why you don't see a difference. But you could also write this if you wanted to, the component scan and configuration, which so, are two yeah. of them, two of the, the annotations that uh, you mm -hmm. have in Spring Boot application. It's the only thing we don't get here is the auto configuration. So you're basically starting a Spring Boot app without the auto config. So there is nothing really specific about Spring Boot application. It's just an opinion about the fact that your Spring Boot app is a configuration class that you want to scan from the package where the Spring Boot application is defined, and you want to use the auto configuration infrastructure. So if I move this class, uh, as, as Brian explained, if I move this class, for instance, in a sub package, then the, the, this one won't be found anymore, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So to summarize, so this is what we've got. We've got our application, a component. So those components in beans, uh, when your application starts, what happens, it's being picked up by Spring uh, amongst other component types of components. And those are turned into beans uh, well, for your application to be useful, right? And, but those beans are in a separate phase, are what we call the user configuration phase. Uh, so this is uh, specific to, to boot. Uh, we are separating in two phases. One is all the components in your application code. All of those are gathered in turn uh, into bean definitions uh, at a certain st stage. And there's a separate phase, uh, which is the auto configuration one. And that's where we look at all the possible and candidate beans into the auto configuration that Boots provides. And, um, and that's where uh, we, we can create uh, the beans that the boot configuration will, uh, will provide, depending on your opinions. So that's really key, right? Uh, so the component, scan uh, the component scan here term is just an example. You could have used import or XML resources if, if you want to do that for whatever reason. Um, so it's not really only about component scan. It's, it's really about everything you have defined um, and the reason why it works in two phases, as you'll see in, in the examples today, is that we need to know what are your opinions before applying ours. So we need to know if eventually you've provided a data source. If you've provided a data source in user configuration, we don't have to configure one because you have an opinion about this. So we need to detect that the user configuration on your left is actually, actually contains that beans and we don't have to create one. So we can try and use that um, in a basic auto configuration. So we can take our application, the one we have already, and uh, we'd like to create an auto configuration for our uh, hello service. So we'd like to, just like boot, have a, a way to provide a hello service if there's none, or flexibly um, provide a, uh, recognize your opinions when you, when you have some, and uh, do something flexible uh, with, with, that, with, the, with that library. So. so don't worry too much about the code. Um, we'll share uh, the repository with you at the end of the talk. Um, each demo is in one commit, mm. and each commit has a message explaining well, what, what that's supposed to do. So you can go back later and review it. So I, I, did ch I, I was lazy, so I did check out the commit just to um, get a new module in our uh, project which is called Hello Starter. And basically what we are going to do now is create a custom starter for the Hello service. So if we look at the Hello configuration class, you can see it's like nothing for now. And we have a test. Um, 
which does not match. And what we want to do is we, we want to say, okay, uh, we want to start Spring Boot with um, a certain, oh, oh, am I on the right branch? Are you? Um, no, I'm not on the right branch. Okay, sorry about that. I'm not in the right branch, why? Okay, let's fix this. One thing that you can think about that specific starter project, uh, here we'll mix both the auto configuration and the actual dependencies. What happens in, in real life when you pull a starter, a Spring Boot starter, you only get the dependencies and the auto configuration is already built in Spring Boot itself. But if you wanna have your own starter in your company, uh, you can definitely do that. You can create a project, have the auto configuration in it, provide some dependencies, and write exactly what we're about to write. So you can express uh, how some certain library could, should be used in your company, uh, the default opinions it should have, all the properties, configuration properties, uh, you should provide so that, so, so that users can change that default opinion in some ways. So just like all the things uh, we, you have already with Boot, uh, by the end of that talk, you'll know how to build the same thing for your own library, and so you can use that in, in several projects. So actually, we have two branches on this project. We have one, which is the original talk, um, based on 1.5. And we have a new branch now, uh, which is what you see, uh, based on Spring Boot 2. Uh, it was supposed to be 2.0.m7, and yesterday, when we had a look to the examples, we obviously found a bug. Always happens. So, so we had to switch to snapshot. By the way, you need to remember that. I uh, need to make sure that we are on, on the snapshot. I oh. just ch change it. So okay. the main difference, if you had a chance to look at the test, could have seen some infrastructure bits, bits and pieces. In 2.0, there is a new uh, utility class called Application Context Runner, and it's really a great way to test your auto configuration. So you can bootstrap the runner by basically saying, these, these are the, the auto configurations that I want to enable for this test. So what we want to do is um, we want to say, if I start a Spring Boot app with nothing, no customization, nothing, uh, basically, the, uh, the hello auto configuration will kick in. What I want to do in this case is I want to assert uh, that um, there is one bean of a certain type, uh, which is in this case um, does a single bean, sorry. Hello service, which will not resolve because I haven't really changed my POM yet. So let's do that. Okay. So my starter, um, what, should I, what do I need to do for my starter? It doesn't really rely on anything, so let's use the, the basic one. And I need a dependency on my service. So and this we'll, would be the library you're, you, you'd like to create another configuration for, and the boot starter dependency provides the basic infrastructure you'll need to write your own auto configuration and everything. So there's really two ways to think of it when, if you want to build a, um, a starter, and we'll choose the, the easy one. Mm -hmm. But the most, the, I wouldn't call it the common one, but once you have more code, it's a good idea to separate the code from the starter. So you have one module with the auto configuration so that you can use that independently, and you have the starter that brings the auto configuration, of course, and the dependencies that you think are the right ones for that use case. In this particular uh, scenario, we are shipping the code and the library in one module. Um, so if you, if you had that in two modules, this would definitely be optional so that you don't have a transitive dependency if you, if you rely on the code. So you could have the, the auto configuration code, but not the library. And adding the library is actually the thing that enables the auto configuration. Yeah. Okay, so um, as you can see, the, the context here is an assert assert. So I have those uh, nice uh, utility uh, method I can invoke. So now what I can do is I can actually uh, get the hello service from the context and say hello. And now I can assert uh, this output capture is something that uh, captures yeah. the output. So this is very useful if you want to test something in your, this isn't Spring Boot test, right? Yes. That output capture. So if you want to test something um, in your code that should write to uh, system out and you want to 
see if it, if it did. Output capture is a pretty handy rule to do that, so you can test if something was printed in, in the console or not. So again, start with a test. And um, in this case, it fails, as it should, because there is no such hello service being right? We haven't provided any. So let's now work on our auto configuration. So the goal of our auto configuration is to provide that bean. So we, did, we have that library, and we want to configure things for, for, for developers so they don't have to do that thing manually. So for now, a, a, an auto configuration is just a classic configuration. And the more flexibility and opinions and, uh, and, uh, and, and things you want to add, uh, the, the more we'll see uh, it'll be different. But for now, it's just a simple configuration where you declare a bean. And that's a not our configuration. So the, 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 the main difference, so there is only one difference, uh, critical difference between configuration and auto configuration is the life cycle of it. So remember, you've seen those user configuration on the left and the auto configuration on the right. So we need to make sure that this auto configuration actually is being processed on, on the right phase, so the phase of the auto config. And we don't want to use any kind of component scanning for that, right? So what we want to do is that you'll be able to drop a jar file somewhere. It doesn't matter what the component scan, uh, how the component scan is configured, if it's configured at all. So if the user has decided to disable component scan, you should still be able to process the auto configuration. Mm -hmm. So the way it works is you need to register your auto configuration in a file called um, Spring Factories in the metainf directory, so I'm doing this now. And to make sure you remember to which key you need to re register it, you just use the fully qualified name of enable auto configuration for that. So basically what I'm saying is this, this, this jar file defines a set of auto configuration, and right now we only have one. So let's, let's register it like this, okay? So this is, this is what it takes. You write regular configuration, you register it in the Spring Factories file, and you get another configuration. So let's, let's run our test again. There you go. Good. So we have our bean. We have, it wasn't really hard to configure, right? But no. this is a sample. But we, we provided something for, for the user, and it's just a configura configuration class that other developers don't have to, don't have to write anymore. Uh, but we probably need something uh, something more clever in that sense, because right. uh, in Spring Boot, when you have an opinion, we don't like send you, uh, throw you throw beans at you, and you you have a chance to change things. And for now, it's just just not the case. So it's very basic for now, but we will we will improve it. So yeah. um, let's replace the hello service by the starter. That's what you that's what you do when you use Spring Boot, right? You use Spring Boot starter something, and then you get a sensible default. And let's let's run the app. Right, so if you've noticed, um, our custom prefix has disappeared. We're back with the default behavior of hello world. Remember that we expressed an opinion here uh, that the prefix would be howdy. So something is wrong, and we, go, we are going to see how we can fix that. So with that, to, to summarize that, so with the, our basic configuration, Auto configuration. What you need to have for an auto configuration is just a configuration class that uh, won't be scanned, shouldn't be scanned. Instead, we are declaring it in a Spring.factories file, and this is how it will be discovered by, by Spring Boot, and this is how uh, the configuration will, will be processed. And again, uh, this behavior has nothing to do with Spring Boot, the Spring.factories mm. facility. It's something that exists in Spring Framework for plenty of other use cases, so we, we are just reusing something that already exists. So if you take that part and you look at the actual auto configuration, for now that auto configuration is really simple. It's just a configuration class that you could have written yourself. It's really super simple. We're just declaring a bean, and this, is, will, be, this will be provided in the um, auto configuration phase, uh, that second part. So this is why when we are overriding your opinion, because in the user phase, you are providing your own, and then in the auto configuration phase, we are overriding that and we are uh, providing uh, that one. So this is not what we want, but this is how it works for now. We better improve that. Right, so let's fix it. Um, let's first create a test. Uh, what we want to do is to 
uh, simulate that the user has provided its own version of it. So let's create a user configuration in our test. So we want to simulate what a user would do um, using your infrastructure, basically. So and let's, let's just so you know the um, application uh, context runner that we have. Uh, previously in Spring Boot 1.4, uh, we were testing things in a more um, manual way, I'd say. Uh, so this is more involved. We would set up the context ourselves, and we would uh, register the configurations in the right order. And this is something uh, you came up with, I think, yes. um, to, um, because it was easy to mix things up in our own code base and to test things the wrong way. Uh, at least this way, we can see th this is the, the configuration classes that are uh, dedicated for the other configuration. Those are the ones that should be provided by developers, and we are testing the several scenarios. So it's just a, an easier way to test things, but behind that is just regular uh, context setup with Spring Framework, not, nothing, nothing fancy. So um, what we want to do is we want to say, I want to start a Spring Boot app, or mini, mini Spring Boot app, with the auto configuration. And I want to apply that user config. So I want to simulate that the user has defined that in its configuration. So to do that, we, we have explicit support in the context runner. We could say with user configuration, with a class. And that's going to do the right thing. So if we start this test, you'll notice that. Um, so in that case, we have the other configuration, the configuration provided by the user. And we want to make sure that the opinion uh, provided by the, the, the developer is still there. And for now, it's not, because uh, we're providing our own component no matter what. Right. So the outcome of the test now is, oh, I have two beans. I have my hello service, which is this one. And I have um, hello service, which is this one. So what we want to do now is we want to express in our auto configuration that if a bean of that type already exists, we shouldn't do anything. And that's where the conditions comes into play. So I could say uh, conditional on missing bean on this type, and it will default to the return type of the method. So I could say also conditional on missing bean console hello service if I want to narrow it down for whatever reason, mm. right? But that's not what I want to do. So that's one. And two, uh, we will also want to say if the hello service library is not here, there is no reason for us to kick in. So don't even, don't even try to do anything if hello service is not there. So for that, we can add a condition on class on one, one, one class that's supposed to be in that library. Yeah. So what, what that will do concretely is it will check if whether or not that class is on the class path. And if it's not, it will simply discard the, the whole content of the config. And conditions are not, uh, were not written by, by Spring Boot. The basic condition support is written in Spring Framework as a Spring Framework 4. Uh, and the actual profile, when you uh, act activate a profile in your Spring application, this is being supported by that same mechanism. So uh, looking if that profile is enabled, then uh, I'm enabling that configuration or not en enabling that one. And in Spring Boot, we're shipping a few more conditions that are uh, quite local to Spring Boot because it's, there are more opinions and more assumptions in Spring Boot that we can have. Uh, so we provide uh, richer uh, conditions that, that you can reuse in your, uh, in your auto configurations. Right, so let's, let's start the app with uh, this change where we finally respect what the user has, has uh, decided and we are back in business, right? But we are start, we're still not using the, uh, the auto configuration in our app, which is a shame because it's so complex to configure the console service. I would like not to do that myself, right? I want the auto configuration to do that for me. So let's remove this. And of course, then we are back with the default. So our custom prefix is gone. Okay? So this is the next step. This is the, 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 the next, step that, next step that we want to show you is once you have an auto-configuration that's being defined, how do you provide users with customization choices? Mm. Or can you give, give them options so that they can tell you, oh yeah, I'm happy with the auto-configuration, the way you, you do things, but I don't want the Tomcat on port 8080. I want Tomcat on port 7070. 
And because you have this opinion, it's no reason that you have to configure Tomcat yourself. You should only be able to say 7070, please, instead of 8080. And the way to do that, um, as you know, uh, as a Spring Boot user, is to define a property. So now we, we are going to show you how you can define properties and how you can use that within your own auto configuration. Can we show the uh, auto configuration report, maybe? Or uh, later, maybe? No, yeah, we can do that. Because it, it can be sometimes uh, super confusing. You don't know why this auto configuration was processed or not. Uh, and uh, the auto configuration report, you can, you can trigger that using many ways, uh, dash dash debug on the command line or an environment variable in many ways. And uh, when you start your application, you get a nice uh, report with all the auto configuration that were processed, uh, why they were activated or not, which condition uh, matched or didn't match. This is really super useful if you thought something would happen or shouldn't happen, this is what you should look at. And, uh, the, some, yeah, the most obvious one, if, if your auto configuration doesn't show up here, it's probably because you forgot the spring.factories file or something like this. So this is a good, very good step to, um, if you didn't write tests, uh, it's a very good te test to, to see what happens. So if um, STS also has a dedicated flag for that, I don't know about NetBeans, um, but if you, if you use an IDE that doesn't have explicit support for it, the, the deal is to, uh, start your app with um, something like uh, debug. So if you if you pass a system property debug, or if you pass it like this, then that will enable the debug mode, and the debug mode will print out the auto configuration report at the end. So if I put back if I put back my 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 customization, so I put back the, the my bin definition, and I restart the app you'll see that the auto configuration will back off because there is already a bin. So we can see that it matches because the library is present. Mm -hmm. So we are, going to con we are going to consider this auto configuration, but this, this one, and you see the, the name of the method there, this one didn't match because there is a bin of that type already. So you can actually analyze what, what happened. Um, you can also see that from the web. Uh, if, you, if you are building a web application, there is an actuator endpoint that you can invoke uh, to, to see the same thing. Mm -hmm. But it's more convenient when you, when you work in DID to use this. So to summarize, uh, our auto configuration is processed after the user configuration, and it can provide more or even override things. Uh, but the goal is to be more lenient and to let the, the, your opinions uh, to, in, in your application and not overwrite things when you didn't want to. Uh, but the next step is, for now, it's just an all or nothing uh, kind of deal. Uh, and you, you probably want to just tweak the one thing, like Stefan said, uh, instead of uh, writing everything yourself. So let's, um, let's update our first test. Um, let's assume that now the prefix and the suffix is configurable. We can provide a, we can configure that via application properties if you wanted to. And you want to simulate the fact that the user somewhere, doesn't matter where, but somewhere, has defined one key. So let's say, um, again, there's dedicated support for that in, uh, in the context runner. So I could say something like, uh, I don't know, um, test. And if I do that, this change, right? This is what we want to do. And that's obviously going to fail since we haven't implemented anything. So hello world does not contain test world. Uh, so let's implement that. So we want to expose two properties, hello prefix, hello suffix, and we want to use that within our auto configuration. And uh, those properties, they can be provided by the developers but in uh, the application of the properties file as an environment variable, uh, all the different uh, ways to provide configuration properties. But here in the testing environment, we have a single way of defining them. So to, um, to, to define that, there, the, the, the best option you have uh, with Spring Boot is to define a type. And that type uh, defines the properties that you want to expose. And you, you need to give it a prefix. So you need to tell, please bind from a, a, a certain area of the configuration. To do that, you add configuration properties on, on the object, and this will basically expose two properties, hello.prefix and hello.suffix. So right? configuration properties is just about saying this is a properties class and this is in the namespace, 
but that's it. It doesn't it doesn't declare uh, the properties class anywhere. It doesn't. It's not picked up for now. So this is still a simple pojo, but what we can do is we can enable pr the processing of that class conditionally. So if that auto configuration can kick in, so if the hello service library is present, if the condition defined here are matches basically, then please create a bin for me um, with the hello properties class. And once I have that, well, it's a bin, so I can inject it as usual. And I can, I can fine tune my auto configuration. So I can say, rather than going with, with hard coded value, uh, please use those, those customizations. So we're doing that as well in Spring Boot. So you know that we're not binding all the possible configuration properties that we support. If you don't have RabbitMQ, for example, we won't do the work for the, all the RabbitMQ properties, right? So this is something that saves time. And uh, this is always something, it is also something that saves from complexity. You know that it, it just belongs there and it shouldn't be used anywhere. Right, so this is our auto configuration now. There is a bit more to it. Uh, so we're basically careful not to kick in if the library is present. We're careful not to create the, the, the service if you already provided one. And we look in the environment automatically in case you've customized it. So the next step is to basically use that within our app and simply to use here a loaded prefix Audi and run the app. And we're back, with, back in business now with what we had initially, except that the only customization that we've made is this. Okay? The auto configuration takes care of the rest. There's still one problem though. Yeah. is the ID is complaining that this property does not exist, right? Mm -hmm. So if I type hello, hello here, I don't have any auto-completion. You've used to that. Yeah. If, if you, you do that with good. server, for example, you get... Let's do that with server. Yeah. Uh, Server.port, for instance. Then you can see all the options you have to configure the embedded container. So it would be nice for your own auto-configuration if you could benefit from that. So we can show you how to do this quickly. Um, you've noticed also maybe um, yeah. a banner here that complains the Spring Boot configuration annotation processor wasn't found. And the reason why it's complaining is because that component is responsible for, for generating a metadata file about your configuration properties. And that metadata file is used by third party clients. So let me add the dependency here. And we, don't need, we only need that locally, so there is no reason to... Uh, Just for compilation. It's, it's not useful at runtime. And let's go back here. And it's not uh, yellow anymore. And I can see the suffix as well, and the default value. We could go further. Um, as we do, if, if you've looked at the uh, Spring Boot code base, you've probably, no, you've probably noticed that on those classes we had, we had javadoc on field. Uh, that's because that, uh, that documentation is used um, for documenting the keys. Something like that, very clever. And just recompiling will create a, uh, a metadata file inside the jar, and that will be picked up by, by the IDEs. So it's supported in uh, STS, NetBeans, uh, IntelliJ, Right, and many others. So in the end, uh, that processor is basically creating this file. Nothing fancy. So it's basically detecting the properties and just storing that metadata. And IDs read that simply to give you um, um, automatic uh, intentions about what you type. So what that means also is if you don't, if you don't want to use that component, you want to write that yourself for whatever reason, for keys that you manage yourself. That's perfectly fine. Just write that, and the ID will pick that up. OK, so to summarize, uh, with our configuration class, we went from a uh, regular configuration class that always does the same thing. It's just a copy and paste of what you, you, you'd have written in your own application. But then we added a few, a few twists. The first one was the condition to only be triggered when the library is actually there. And the other one is to back off when uh, the developer provides a, uh, an opinion. 
So those conditions are super useful, and that's where all the flexibility comes from in Spring Boot. Uh, so you, we saw conditional missing being, uh, so uh, process this, uh, this, this class or uh, this method uh, when the, there's no being of that type. Uh, conditional class, do this only if there's that class on the class path. But there are many others, so conditional on being, on missing class, so just the opposites. Conditional on property, so if you've got a property present defined by the developer uh, mm -hmm. with a certain value. Uh, other more complex conditions, so is it a web application of which type? Uh, we've got a servlet and a reactive now. Mm -hmm. uh, is it not a web application? Uh, on resource, so do you have a resource uh, present on the class pass? Or? For that, you can imagine that you have like some conventions in your company, right? You have a file at a specific location, and when that file in that location is present, you want to do something, mm. because that's some company's default in your development environment. Well, you could write an, an auto configuration that detects that and does something about it. Mm. There is a single candidate, so if you provide just one bin of, uh, of one type, and not several. Uh, conditional Java, we're not using that a lot anymore. Yeah, well, Java changes so much now. <laughs> conditional, yeah, conditional Java 32. We mm -hmm. can, uh, 42. So, <laughs> so we have that right now, plus uh, JNDI, in case you want to check things out in, J in JNDI, and expre expression, which is about uh, spell ex expressions. Don't do that. Usually, when we see developers using that one, 99% of the time you can do that uh, in a simpler way with conditional property often. Mm -hmm. And uh, very often as well, uh, if it's more complex than that, uh, either you have a crazy, crazy long uh, expression or it deserves its own condition, something you can definitely implement yourself. And we will show you how to do that. Exactly. So please don't do that. And uh, so the, the, the whole deal behind uh, enable auto configuration is that when you have that uh, annotation uh, in your application, uh, it, it's, um, it's asking for uh, those Spring Factories file to be processed. When we look at those, we see all the auto configurations that are present. And uh, when we have those auto configuration, we look at each. So if it's just a configuration class, then we process it, we do everything in it. If there is a conditional on something on that class for Bravo, for example, and if that condition does not match, we don't do anything. We, we, don't, we, don't, read, uh, we don't process that auto configuration. If everything checks out, just like Charlie, uh, then we process uh, that class, auto configuration class. And in case of Delta, uh, the first condition that doesn't match, we don't even care about the others. We won't, we won't uh, process the other conditions. Uh, so we, we are as fast as we can for about conditions. And certain of those conditions actually apply without even loading the class itself. So mm -hmm. you've seen, for instance, conditional on class hello service.class, and you may wonder, okay, if I'm writing hello service.class in the code and hello service is not on the class pass, how, how does it work? And the reason why it works is because that uh, certain conditions are actually processed by reading the bytecode. So we use ASM to write the bytecode of the class, we extract those uh, tokens from the, from the bytecode, and we apply the condition. And if the condition doesn't, doesn't match, we don't even know the class itself. That was 1.4. Yes. And uh, in 2.0, oh, yeah. we're right. doing even something even better. So without even reading the file, so before we weren't reading the class, mm -hmm. loading the class, and, but we were reading the first bytecode instructions, and now we're uh, at, comp at compilation time, we are writing some kind of index where we express that condition in, in an index. And so this is even, even faster. So we just look at this and we see all those conditional classes, uh, conditional class uh, conditions, and we are just uh, executing those at that point. So it's even faster. So we have two so, auto, auto configurations. So yeah, two of those uh, of the four matched. Um, if you look at Charlie, for example, um, let's say inside that class, you also have another, uh, other methods and conditions. And just like the top level annotations, we look at the conditions, uh, ex execute those, see if they match or not. If they match, then we uh, execute the, the bean method and we have a new bean in our context. If not, then we don't do anything. 
So uh, we told you that uh, we were executing one condition after the other, and we told you that, and you can see that some are uh, quite uh, easy conditional in class. It's just looking, uh, do I have that class in my class path? But others, like conditional on bean, it's uh, much more complex because you have to look at, if, is there a bean like this in my context? But since, we, since um, it depends on when you do that, so if you do that at, at a certain point in time, maybe someone later will create that bean and you'll get a condition negative, but actually it was positive for some other reason. So order is everything here. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look at those, single candidate bean and missing bean, we are executing those at a separate phase. So all the others, they are executed quite early. And uh, the, uh, the other three, we are executing a bit later when the others had a chance to, uh, to contribute things to the context. And that's why it's very important that you have user configuration on one side and auto configuration on the others, right? Because if we check, oh, did the user provide, in, provide it a bin of type A? We need to make sure that everything on the user side has been processed and we actually know what you've, pro what you've defined before actually running those conditions. Yeah. And as you'll see later, you could also have, and we have that in Spring Boot, you can also have um, such conditions between auto configurations, so auto configurations competing with each other. So it's, for that case, it's very important that they are ordered properly and we'll, mm. show, you, we'll show you how to do that. Yeah, definitely. And uh, so that's a, the two-phase thing. But as well, if you look at those conditions, some of them are really cheap and some others are more complex. They require more work. And if you've got several of them uh, on a single class, for example, it'll be a bit silly to check for the very expensive ones first if the very simple one doesn't, doesn't match, right? So that's what we do. There is a specific order uh, um, that we use to, uh, to process the, the conditions. And uh, this is how you can speed up um, the processing of your auto configurations. So and actually, th that's why in some cases, and very often, adding more conditions does not equal being slower. Uh, because if you add the cheap ones, then chances are you'll be just faster. Yeah. So advanced tips, if you write uh, your own condition, try to find a sensitive, sensitive order. So if your condition is, is a bit expensive, try to put it below the chain, so give it a, a high order. On the contrary, if the, if the condition is very fast to check, just put it a lower order. Okay. So let's say we want to write our own condition. Not, nothing, um, none of those uh, matches what we would like to do. So let's write our own condition so we can have something more flexible in our application. 45 first, minutes already. Yeah. About the break? Yeah, sure. Sugar in your break. brain, whatever, if you're still alive. And we see you in 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Thank you. Awesome. So we had plenty of questions. That's amazing. Thank you very much. I hope uh, we'll have more at the end. Uh, the good news also is that we had uh, some, I don't know you because we haven't had a to chat actually, <laughs> but on my side, I had like uh, a couple of questions or even more than that, that we are actually going to address hopefully now. Cool. So that's the good news. So we were at, um, conditions, and I was telling you um, about, well, me and Brian were mm -hmm. telling you about uh, some, some important things to know about conditions. So let's build our own conditions, right? So that you'll see it's very easy. It's not something that you'll have to do uh, every time. Uh, it's, it's more of an advanced use case, but we want to show you what, what that means in, in, in practice. Right. So uh, we want to do something a bit silly. Um, if I remember the name of the thing. Of your template? <laughs> yes, what's the name of that template for that again? I think what we'd like is to um, uh, add a specific condition uh, on our configuration to restrict the usage of our library to, um, to only accept certain prefixes or certain rules on our, on our prefix and suffix values. And uh, we'd like to enforce that as a condition level uh, to, um, to, to have a better experience. Right, so it's a bit silly because it's not really representative of what, what you would do, but at least you, you can relate to that for your own use case. So there is two things we want to do is if the hello.prefix property is not set, let's not create the bean because we must have a prefix. So first, let me remove the default one. Okay, no default anymore. Uh, 
here you can see that the, uh, the, the context gives you nice uh, assert utility, so here, like that. And the second thing, which is even, even a bit more funny, is let's say that if the context is, uh, the prefix, sorry, is set, but doesn't start with an uppercase, then the service is not defined either. So that's boo instead of boo, right? Whatever, for whatever reason. Okay, so let's run that. And those two tests will fail uh, because obviously we, we are configuring the service. We haven't done anything yet. So we want to define um, uh, that uh, condition. To define a condition, you, you create a class that extends from Spring Boot condition and you'll get um, a context and you'll get the, the metadata of where the condition has been defined. We'll come back to that in a minute. So you can basically now write any logic you want based on the current status of the context, right? So I'm saying, uh, give me the environment. Uh, do we have a hello.prefix property? Okay, so do we have that? So let's take the first character. Is the first character an uppercase? It's not an uppercase. Then I'm actually saying that the condition doesn't match. Here in this case, it is uppercase, sorry. In this case, it isn't. So you can write, can, you can write a, a detail as why it didn't match. And if you remember the auto configuration report that we've shown you, you get a chance now to tell your team members, okay, I didn't do that because of this, okay? So we provide that infrastructure so that can be displayed. When we showed the auto configuration report, you had all those nice messages. So using that infrastructure gives you the same, uh, the same level of support uh, as the Springwood ones. It's a bit what we've shown you with the keys where you add an annotation processor and then you can have your custom keys um, in, in DID. By the way, this is by no means, this is an auto configuration specific concept, right? So if you, build, if you build a Spring Boot app and you want to expose some configuration items for your app, regardless of the auto configuration, mm -hmm. you do the exact same thing and it will work. Um, notice also that we have a nice DSL to compose standard messages. Um, so now I want to apply this condition to uh, my uh, auto configuration. So how do I do that? I'm just adding the standard Spring Framework conditional where you can specify a class. And let's run that. Green. That was easy. Well, the template did everything, right? I guess. <laughs> so um, you still don't have this nice conditional on something, right? Uh, what, what, what does it need? What do you need to make that happen? It's simply composition. So let's create a conditional on valid hello prefix or whatever use case you are currently implementing. So this is, this is a, an annotation. So yeah, remember if you use an annotation, you still have all those crazy meta thing to add. Yeah. Uh, always forgot them, so. No matter how many you yes, write. Yes, so I copy paste them from somewhere else. That's all. If you don't do that, it won't work. Nothing to do with Spring Boot, by the way. Yeah. Um, for once. <clears throat> then the only thing you have to do, really, is to move this to um, your condition, right? So if you look, if you look at a standard condition, you'll notice this pattern of saying this, this annotation basically requires this condition to kick in. And the advantage of doing so is that you can now make the implementation package private. So you don't have to expose that anymore. So let's replace that with our annotation. Uh, conditional and valid hello prefix and run the test again. It's really moving that, that definition somewhere else. Okay, so let's go back to the app. Um, I'm going to tune the condition a bit more. Um, so what I want to say is to want to make sure that uh, the exception message is as precise as possible. So for condition can actually take the class of an annotation and that will be used to derive uh, the, the message in, in the config report. All right. Um, actually, I was looking at something and I didn't look. Well done, Stefan. Yes. Um, so let's remove the let's remove the prefix. So that should not create the bean, right? 
that should not create the bean in practice. Do you still have to customize? Oh, wonderful. All Forgot right. to remove that. Okay. So since we didn't provide that condition, that, that property, our condition should fail, and we have a nice message saying that we didn't provide that thing. Okay, so it's a very effective way. So not only, uh, yeah, we're actually showcasing two things at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, not only it will show up in the auto configuration reports, but if the application failed to start uh, because it required the bin and that bin will not, wasn't present, then we have a separate component called the failure analyzer. We're going to talk to you uh, that. about that later. Uh, it actually inspects the auto configuration reports for matching beans, and it gives you this nice error message. So creating a good, uh, good message is actually very useful. So again, uh, if I'm putting a value with the lowercase, the application will fail as well. And you get this or whatever the business logic you have in your, in your condition. Well, technical logic or whatever. So if you reuse the infrastructure that we provide, you'll get the same native Spring Boot uh, support that, that you'll get with all the other auto configurations that we provide. So one thing that we all often find is that it's easy to fall into some traps when you're writing your own conditions and on auto configurations. And we'll list a few of those uh, to really make sure that everything's clear. Uh, so let's take a, a few classes, auto configuration classes. Uh, let's say you write an auto configuration that creates a, a, a data access being if uh, taking a single JD, JDBC template, and then another one that crea just creates a data source, and then another one that takes a single data source and creates a JDBC template. You can see that there's a relationship between, uh, between those three. Uh, the thing is, if they don't run in the right order, then you won't get the, same, the thing that you'd expect. So this is an ordering problem that can be quite uh, a big problem, especially since if we don't enforce that, imagine starting your, your boot application and sometimes you get the right thing, sometimes you don't. Uh, so we want to enforce that and make sure that it's uh, triggered in the right order. So uh, if you take those three auto configurations, there's a way to, uh, in, to tell, to, to declare that order. Uh, with the at auto configuration auto configure after annotation, so you can say you should definitely process that auto configuration after JDBC. You should uh, auto configure that one before the other one, etc. So once you've declared that order, uh, those auto configurations are processed in the right order, and you can expect what should happen, which is this one creates a data source. That data source is used in the JDBC one, which creates in turn a JDBC template, which is used there and creates the data access. So if you want that, you need to order things. Otherwise, you won't get the, the expected result. So you're not very familiar with that as a Spring user because you expect the application context to do everything for you, right? Which is a nightmare for us. Trust us. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. <laughs> it's really a nightmare, uh, including uh, dealing with cycles and whatnot. But in this case, it's very different, right? Uh, we process a condition to say, does that bin exist? Do I have only a bin of that type, one bin of that type? And in, in order to make sure it will be, always be uh, consistent with the current auto configuration that are currently defined, we need to make sure that that, that condition runs at the right time. And we can't use the application context to f figure those links because it doesn't work the same way. So it's very important that you order your auto configurations. Cool. Uh, then another trap that's easy to fall into is the conditional on class, not, uh, uh, not set at the, at, the right, um, at, the, at the right place. So let's say we have this uh, auto, configuration, auto configuration class trying to configure uh, JSON as a JSON parser. And you have the conditional on class annotation at the bin method level. If you do that, then when the auto configuration is processed, then we see, oh, that, that configuration class has no conditions, so let's go, let's load that configuration class. And then loading that class will, load, will read the methods. And it, when you read the method, you have to read the types. And here, will, the JVM will try to read the JSON type. It won't be there, it'll blow up. So that condition there, conditional class, is not at the, at the right, at the right uh, place. 
because the, that type is not known at that level. So like we said before, if you want to make sure to not fall into that trap, you should move the conditional on class at that level. And um, you get two things. One, it's working. And two, uh, <laughs> and two, it's faster, because we won't even load that class at all. We'll just look at, look at our index, and we'll do that at comp compilation time, and it'll be super fast. Uh, one thing just to remind you, uh, we've got two phases, one about uh, looking at the user configuration and the other one at auto configurations. Uh, so if you look at this, and this is a application configuration, so something that you have in the user, in the, your own application. So the if you try, left. sorry? The thing on the left. Yeah. yeah. So this is processed at, during the first phase. And if you try to ha have a, some conditions, like condition on, condition on class, things like this should work, right? It's a condition, so yeah, basic condition. But for some specific conditions, the ones we highlighted uh, before, uh, it, won't def it won't work at all. I mean, it there's won't work like you expect. There's a chance it will work, but you, know, you can't be sure. So because at that point, if you, if you, uh, if you want to check if there's a custom bin instance somewhere, uh, at that point, during that first phase, there, there may not be, but uh, if there should be one provided by auto configuration, at that point, those aren't being processed. We, we don't even know about those. So it's, it's too early. We, we can't know about this at that point. So doing that, you won't really uh, be respecting the opinions of, of the application. You'll just do something that's not expected. So don't do that. Don't use that condition. Those conditions uh, in uh, user configurations. Right. Um, so let's go ahead and, and customize the, the app a bit more, um, and let's build something that's not an auto configuration, but something that allows you to um, tune how the um, how the environment is processed. So um, I have I have this file somewhere on my machine. Uh, Dot hello. Is that dot hello? Oh, yeah, okay. I need it's to in your user. Yeah, yeah of course. Uh, yeah. I need to wake up, you know. <laughs> so right there. Okay. I have on my home directory in the dot hello slash settings directory, I have hello prefix dot high. Right. So now let's assume for a second um, that you're building an app and um, you, you have rules within the team and you want to share some, well, you want to be able to define some local settings, but you don't want to put that in the Git repo. You want to have that in your, um, in your home, and home directory, for instance. So how can you ask Spring Boot when it starts the app to actually look at that location and update the environment with those information? So think about what, what you, you'll be able to do. It's quite convenient. So um, let's implement that. Do I have that already or not? I always forget. I do. Very con convenient to type when you have nothing to type, right? Um, <laughs> so the, the hook point is environment post processor. It's a way for you to tell Spring Boot that you want to do something extra with the environment before starting the app. Um, so this is very easy. I'm getting the user home directory uh, for location, which is the dot hello slash settings location. If there is a file, then I'm loading the file, uh, and I'm adding the file in the list of property sources of the environment. So we'll, we'll, sh we'll show that in a minute. So now I want, I want that thing to be invoked regardless, right? So I've put it in the app, but you could have put that in the auto configuration, or you could, you could have put that in some shared library that your company is using, whatever the use case is. So I want to make sure that this is invoked, regardless of user's configuration. And the way to do this, uh, well, it will look familiar because we've done that already this, this afternoon, is to create a Spring Factories file and define the fully qualified name of our implementation. So I told you the key for auto configuration is enable auto configuration, and the key for an environment post processor is environment post processor. Very, very, very hard. And then fully qualified name, and same thing. This is the way to declare it. And once we have that, uh, we know about that environment post processor, and it, it'll be invoked uh, at startup time. There we go. So now I have. Uh, 
high world. Okay? So let's quickly turn on this app into a web app, just to show you one more feature. And let's make sure that a management. Yeah, and but it's it's loading the snapshot from the internet, you know. So uh -huh. okay. is that a good idea? Maybe I should switch to Yeah. Come on internet, snapshots. you can do this. Okay. Um, one thing that we use the environment process 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 processor for, mm -hmm. I believe, is for DevTools, right? Yes. So when you have death tools on your uh, class path and you're running the application locally, you probably notice that there are a few things that we customize for you. For example, the, uh, we set the cache, uh, the HTTP cache for resources to zero. We make sure that the templating engines don't cache things. So when you change a template, it, the, the changes are reflected, stuff like that. So those are all properties. And those properties are changed for you uh, at application startup. Uh, so we change the defaults. Uh, in an environment post processor, so th th that's one of the use case for for this. Uh, if you if you want to use it, so now you need to switch to dancing, Ryan. Ah, I don't have anything interesting to say. Anymore. No. <laughs> okay, whatever. Um, you want to either on my phone, maybe? No. Okay, let's try that. I always do a nuclear option. There we go. There's a silly Maven process sometimes that hangs if the network is, is slow. So, dance, small dance? Yeah, okay. <laughs> what do you mean, okay, do it? You know, I'm stuck on the keyboard, I can't do anything. Okay. Um, other, something more interesting as well? Um, Doesn't want to dance. Yeah. Trying to think of something. Dance, it will work, I'm telling you. Um, so I owe you two beers now. Yeah, yeah, three. Make it three. Three. <laughs> He's mad. Good. No. Scanning. Scanning files to index. Okay. okay. So what we're actually trying to change here is that since Spring Boot 2.0, uh, by default we don't expose all the actuators endpoints because uh, we found that in some cases uh, it was easy to create an application, add actuator. Um, push it to production and forget that you didn't secure those endpoints. And those, some of those can be uh, uh, quite uh, uh, sensible uh, with, with regards to security because you expose a lot of things. Uh, so for now, we're doing the safe thing, which is only expose the ones that are safe. And if you want to expose more, you have to do, just like Stefan did, you have to provide a configuration property saying, I want to expose those or I want to expose everything with a wildcard. So that's, that's a new feature in Spring Boot 2, uh, where if you require a particular um, key of the environment, you'll get a very detailed output. Uh, so in this case, I, I can see that the value that's actually being used by, by my application is high. We know that. Uh, it's coming from the LO local, the LO local property source. So let's link that to uh, actually this, right? And these are the property sources that could have matched. Um, so you can also see where in that file the property is being defined. So line one, character 14. These are the other property sources that may have matched, and there's a, an extra one here. And the trick is that the order of the property sources is the order in which they, are, they, they will be evaluated. So as soon as you find a key in one, this is the one that we are going to use, right? So LO local is before application config. So the value isn't howdy, but the value is high. Mm. Okay? Uh, same thing if you look at the environment. Um, if you look at the environment, you'll get uh, all the property sources with all the keys. So a bunch of information, as you can see. And Brian mentioned DevTools. Uh, do I have DevTools here? Uh, we don't. Do you know you just have actuator? Did I? But it, it's basically it's super useful uh, because we had at some point we had a lot of reports uh, with developers saying, "Oh, I'm I didn't configure it that way. I don't know why where it came came from." And if you look at this, sometimes you can you can see that you had you had an unexpected environment variable in the in your environment, uh, for example, QA environment, 
and you, that you didn't know about, or there was a file that you didn't know about, and, what, and so on. So this is the best way to know what's going on with, uh, obviously, the uh, configuration report. If you look at those two things, you pretty much know why and how things were configured for you. How much time do we have left, I wonder? Uh, it's still, uh, we've got 30 minutes or so. No? Really? We, we have 30 minutes? 20? 20. Okay. Make it 20. Okay, cool. Fine. So, application events. I need to apologize to the person I have a meeting with now. Apparently, <laughs> I made a mistake in my agenda. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Run. Sorry. So, Spring Boot events. When you start a Spring Boot application, this is how things uh, unroll. So, you run the application, then you first have an application event, uh, which is the application starting event. So, you can use those events uh, and to hook those into those and do something when at that point of the application uh, starting process. So, but what's really important here also is that you understand what we do on startup. Yeah. And um, also the things that we do, the order in which we do it, why we do it that way. Uh, that will explain, for instance, I had a question during the break, what well, wasn't really that question, but um, the person said, I'm using add property source in my configuration and the con the, it seems that it's not being applied at the right time. So I hope that this will help to um, demystify that, yeah. that part. So first you have the, the starting event. At that point, we start initializing the logging infrastructure but it's not ready yet, so you won't see logs at that point. And the reason why we do this is uh, log back by default when you initialize it and you don't give it a configuration, it logs at debug level by default. So mm -hmm. we don't want to do that at this point because we don't know what the logging configuration will be. Yeah. So if you pr provide an opinion in your application property saying I want to log things at info and that package like this and with that format of logging, and if when you start your applications, you get a different format, and at some point it gets applied, that would be too strange. So this is, this is one of the reasons. Uh, then you get application environment prepared, a prepared event. Um, uh, and then at that point, what we are doing is we are reading the configuration files. We are applying the environment post processors. So that's what we created right before. And that's when the logging initialization is done. And at that point, things are being logged properly. And that's why the environment post-processor that we've just showcased previously, um, it runs at the right time. So it's invoked before the application context even starts, even before the logging system completes. So for instance, if you want to move logging configuration to the settings file, you want to say, oh, on my machine, I want to debug that, that package in trace level, but I don't want to hard code that in the project itself. You can put that in that file and it will be taken into account. And then application prepared event. And then the application context is refreshed. So that's when things start really to happen. We get the context refreshed event. Then Which is the only event that's, that's Spring Framework based. All yeah. the other events are Spring Boot specific and due to the Spring Boot initialization. Context refresh event, you've probably seen it if, you, if you've used Spring Framework directly. So that, that's an event that says, Beans are, the, the beans are ready, basically. Yeah, and at that point, we uh, um, start the embedded servlet containers uh, connectors, but we are not making them available right away. So, because we want to make sure that your application is fully ready before you start serving uh, traffic. So at that point, we start those connectors. We don't make them available right away. But w since we have the port information at that point, even if you said port zero, so Take, take one available. So we have that port information available, and at that point we make, we, we uh, uh, send an event, which is the container initialized event, and that event has information including the, the actual port of your application, uh, of your web server. And right after you have the ready event, your application is ready, so even if your application is not a web application, you'd still get the second one. And at that point, we run the common line runner. So the, the ones we added earlier, if you ha have something implementing common line runner or application runner, we do that at that point when the application has started and when uh, your uh, connectors are exposed and ready. Done. Uh, failure analyzer, we... We've seen a few. We've seen a few indeed. Uh, so a failure analyzer, it's pretty useful. Uh, the goal of uh, this feature is to provide a nice message 
that describes uh, what's the problem and what you should do instead of just throwing stack traces at you. So uh, we have um, a few uh, failure analyzer and a, failure, and a few exceptions that go with them. So a few exceptions that we deal with, uh, with failure analyzers, for example, for example, a port you use. If you're trying to start a, a web application and the port is already used by something, uh, previously it was a stack trace, and mm -hmm. now you get a better, uh, better understanding of what's going on. So all of those are uh, kind of exceptions that we deal with right now. And an example of that is that let's say you start your application and you get this. And it, it will end eventually. <laughs> Done. So you get this. Very useful, I'm sure. Which is you counted uh, exactly 340 lines and you want to burn your computer at that point. And uh, with a failure analyzer, what you get is a nice, uh, not a stack trace anymore, but you get a nice uh, failure message that shows you that there's a cycle in your application because that was the exception that you couldn't read. Uh, so there's a bean cycle in your application and it shows you uh, in a nice descriptive way what's going on in your application and probably where the cycle is and how, probably how you should fix it. Yeah, and the backstory is that this this uh, this stack trace we actually revert to a version of Spring Boot where that bug was present just to reproduce the stack trace, <laughs> and we were so angry and so mad. It took so much time to actually find the the, the cycle that we decided to implement this as a result. Mm. Cool. So okay, let's do one. Let's do a custom one. Custom one. Do we have time for that. So let's say you have a complex failure in your application, uh, something in your auto configuration maybe, or something in your, uh, that, that your properties uh, don't match about something, uh, and you, instead of uh, throwing a stack trace at your, uh, at your developers, you'd like to provide a nice descriptive message that something's missing, something's not configured properly, or maybe something uh, is not available, some resource is not available at that time. There are many things that you can take care of. Right. So um, here, what's we'll make it do, fail? Um, okay, let's make it fail first. It should fail with the right exception, I guess. It didn't. You have the file still on disk. Is that is that it? I'm checking. Mm. Yeah, the local file, is that the one? The local file? The in your .hello uh, Oh, folder. good point, yeah, wonderful. You get a cookie. <laughs> so uh, let me override that here. Um, yeah. So let's say here, instead of uh, uh, the previous message we had, which is here, the exception, We'd like to take that exception, which is invalid hello uh, prefix exception, and take that and turn that into a nice descriptive message. So the, 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 the idea here is um, wh whatever, whatever exception it is that's focused to what you're doing, you know exactly what it is, right? And you want to tell something more to your users. It's a fatal exception. The, the application doesn't start because of it. And of course, they can read this. Well, first they need to scroll in the right way. Then they, need to, then they need to read this, and you need to provide that information in the exception itself, and maybe you want to have something more technical in the exception than what you're actually displaying to the user. Don't you want to update your ID right now? No, I guess it's fine. Do it now. Uh, what? Huh? <laughs> oh, click, you want me click. to? Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah, we have enough network for that, I'm sure. <laughs> Okay, so let's create a failure analyzer. So invalid hello prefix, so invalid uh, Java class, invalid hello prefix failure analyzer. There we go. And I want to, there is there's a base class that gives us a nice feature. So abstract failure analyzer. You just give it the, the, the name of the exception. Factory bin? Oh, you know, I need to go back to that, I think. One of those uh, famous classes that everybody loves. You want proxy factory instead? <laughs> uh, there you go, sorry. So invalid hello prefix 
exception. There you go. So what that, that, what that does, it's actually when there is an exception that causes the application to fail, it will, it will look in the nested causes if it finds an application with that type. And if it does, it will call you with the exception that, that occurred, the base one, and the one that it found. And there you have a chance to massage the exception and check about things. So that's what we do for the no such bin definition exception. We look into the auto configuration report if by any chance there is a bin of that type that could have been defined. So it's very important, two things. One is you need a dedicated type mm -hmm. for the use case. So you need an exception of your own. And two, you need to give some information in the exception itself because then you're going to, to get it back to provide a good message to the user. Once we have that, the only thing you need to return is failure analyzer, failure analysis, sorry. It's very easy to it's very easy to unit test because all you have to do is basically invoke that with an exception and make sure that you get the proper message. And the failure analysis is three things. It's a description, an action, and the actual exception. And the reason why we pass the actual exception is because when you run in debug mode, we will anyway uh, we will anyway log the exception because you may want that detail in this case. So a nice descriptive message. That's what I'm doing, right? What you should do is fix the prefix and the provide that value. That's the important part. Uh, otherwise, it's just uh, another exception. You don't really provide context. Yes. And the failure. So I need to make sure that this um, LEO, wow. So this LO, invalid LO prefix failure analyzer runs regardless of the user configuration, right? I don't want them to say, hey, by the way, I know you have this nice feature, so I, I will enable it so I can actually see it. You want that to be enabled by default, so what do you do? Same thing. Yes, Spring Factory is well done. Yeah, yeah. And what's the key of the uh, thing in the Spring Factory? I don't yes. know, the fully qualified name of that thing? Yes, exactly. And the value is the fully qualified name of what you provide. Oh, there we go. Okay, so we've declared it in the spring.factories. And uh, doing that, we can restart our application. And now we have description, action, and here, no stack trace. But still, right. it's uh, like in other, like all the other features, it started as a feature in Spring Boot. And uh, we provided that infrastructure so you can reuse it in your own auto configuration and your own infrastructure. And you still get the same experience uh, as Spring Boot. So we, we're not hiding anything in our infrastructure. Uh, quite the opposite. We're, we want you to use it uh, in your own auto configurations. Exactly. So how much time do we have now? I'm confused. Six minutes. There you go. OK, so we want to stop with some uh, yeah. soft landing so that your brain can rest for a bit. <laughs> so those are uh, common questions that we had all over the place, getter issues, whatnot. Uh, so uh, about startup performance. So we often uh, get the question, my app takes a lot of time to start. What's going on? Uh, I think class path scanning is slow, and that's probably the culprit. <clears throat> and someone uh, <laughs> thought that he tried to fix this situation because we get that feedback a lot. So what that person did was, we'll tell you about that later. But the, the, we did some, a few experiments. And let's say you have a Spring Boot application with 200 beans, so 200 bean definitions, for example. So uh, I, I don't remember exactly. I think it's 5,000. So you have 5,000 classes. Mm -hmm. So you have a, a package and sub-packages, and all that contains 5,000 classes. And amongst those 5,000 classes, you have 200 of them that are flagged with add component, for instance. Mm -hmm. So there are 200 of them that are candidates and 4,800 that are just noise, just regular classes that we shouldn't touch. And that application, when you start it, uh, it takes 6.5 seconds to start. So if you time the actual class path scanning of, the, um, of those classes, how long do you think it takes? OK, so question, 1.5 seconds. One, one second. 1.5. 1 1.5. Who says 1.5 oh. out of 6.5? Oh. Yeah, OK. Remember, okay, I remember 5,000 5, 5, 5, classes and 200 beans. OK. One second. One. Good. Everybody is afraid now to raise their hand. <laughs> 500 milliseconds. Who says five? OK, usually that's more. almost everyone. OK, and yeah. 100 milliseconds? 
Yeah, good nice. boy, good boy, good ladies, often. Yeah. And there you go. <laughs> so often we think, oh, this is class fast scanning. This, this must take for ages and takes a lot of, a lot of resources, but it's not really the case. But still, a certain someone created a Spring Context Indexer in Spring Framework to, uh, to improve that, that process. Um, maybe you can talk about this, or you don't what, want to talk oh, about you, it anymore. You mean, the, you mean the, <laughs> the thing that was useless, you mean? <laughs> um, so it's the same mechanism, right? The same mechanism we've seen, we've already told you about uh, um, at compile time, detecting the conditions, writing that in an index. Um, I've basically built the same thing for components. So we, you add that to a module, it will detect all the components, write that to a file, and when the application starts up, we, we read the file and we look at the components and we don't scan them at runtime, basically. And that creates the meta in Spring components. Um, turns out that if you don't have, if you have less than 50,000 classes, it doesn't make a single difference. So it was pretty much useless. Yeah, but then you have another problem, and it's not ours. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, good. So yeah, if you look into yeah, that, that file, that's basically the content of the file. You have the fully qualified name of the of the class and all the stereotype that this class has. And then we have a reverse index, and then you can you can say, okay, give me all the classes that are mapped with uh, old Spring Framework stereotype component. You'll get that, mm. and that's the outcome. But if you have a lot, a lot, lot classes, then you can use that one, and it can definitely make a difference. But then you have a different problem. Yeah. You, oh, you made that joke again, sorry. <laughs> but it's partly solved or hidden. Uh, OK, then it's not that, that thing. So it still takes a lot of time to start. I'm wondering what it is. And we had someone one day ask, telling us that they had a, a strange behavior on macOS. And that when they start Spring Boot App, it takes 13 seconds. But when they run iTunes and then they retry, it takes one or two seconds. It's an actual report. It's not a joke. No, it's an actual report, yeah. So questions again. Do you think that iTunes is great? <laughs> nobody, nobody thinks that, right? <laughs> or the Spring team created a new annotation, another one, start faster with iTunes. And it's hidden in our code base. It's, it's baked in Spring Boot application somewhere. Yeah. Made and made it. And, uh, or there's a local host DNS resolution thing with macOS Sierra. Obviously, that was that one. And uh, the, the thing is, we, we're not making fun of that person, uh, because uh, often when you think you have a startup time problem, it's easy to think, oh, this is class path. Oh, this is something. And when you actually try to look at it and try to think what it is, it's not always what you think it is. So if you have a problem, and we, we are really often, very often looking at startup time, we, have, uh, we are running tests for each release of Spring Boot, comparing uh, the time between releases, and we make sure that when we see a difference, we try to track down the difference and make that thing as optimized as we can. Um, but if you see a problem, don't hesitate to try to pinpoint what it is, try to come up with a sample that we can take a look at. Mm -hmm. And uh, then from then, we can maybe find an issue in Spring Boot or point you to uh, the culprit. Other things that you can think of, uh, we've seen many of those. It can be some kind of network configuration uh, because you're trying to do something with the network at startup and it's taking a lot of time. Uh, antivirus, uh, if you're on your uh, uh, developing a developer laptop, Sometimes the inner viruses, if you don't ignore your workspace or something like this, it, it can take a lot of time because you have a lot of files. Uh, lack of entropy, but that one has been fixed in Spring Boot 1.4. So to one know. yeah, with Tomcat previously, if you were running into a, a container, yes, that, that was if you're running into a container that lacks entropy, uh, then the startup time could be longer. But we fixed that in Spring Boot 1.4. Uh, so if you see people saying you should use uh, slash dev, slash uh, you random, something like this, instead of blah, blah, blah. You don't have to do that anymore. You don't have to do that anymore. Uh, that was a specific problem. Uh, of course, there's a static code initialization, or um, one neat trick that you can try is to use the JVM no verify flag. That's the YOLO mode. Yeah. <laughs> so this will actually skip some ver verifications on classes. Uh, so this is not very, you don't really need that unless you do JDK serialization or deserialization, stuff like this. But on a developer uh, 
a laptop or a workstation, you can definitely add that flag. It, it, will, and it will make a difference for startup time. Uh, and if you're interested in that topic, please take a look at Dave Sire's uh, repository about this. There's a whole uh, startup benchmark with uh, many tests, many cases, and we're um, uh, taking uh, all those measures uh, to see if the startup times improves or not. It's easy on. also to run those benchmarks on your own machine, so you mm -hmm. can quickly spot if something is wrong locally or some setup that's wrong. Okay. And that was it. We're done. Thank you.